Order. Sir Jeremy Quinn to move the motion. It's a pleasure to use this debate to highlight the ongoing issue of disabled young people's access to their child trust funds. To recognise uh, the goodwill of the Minister and his department, but to demand changes that would solve issues for the courts, CTF providers, and above all, the disabled young people and their families. We have the means to secure easy access to funds that rightfully belong to these young people. Funds that could prove invaluable, but which are denied to them by lack of information and processes that may well be well-meaning in intent, but are Kafkaesque and off-putting in delivery. It's a pleasure to propose the debate under your chairmanship, Ms Elliott. I'm delighted to see the Minister in his place, who I know is focused on this issue, and other honourable members who have taken a real interest in getting to a resolution on this issue. I would like to start by paying tribute to my constituent, Andrew Turner. Back in September 2020, Andrew found that his disabled son, Mikey, was locked out of his child trust fund. He simply wanted to buy an adapted bike for Mike, with Mikey's money, and Mikey's life-limiting condition meant that time was of the essence. The Child Trust Fund was Mikey's only financial asset. This should have been the start of a simple process in which a loving parent who looks after his disabled son can use that child's own funds to enhance the well-being of the child. Instead, Mr Turner found that he and thousands of others were required to go to court when the account matured. Such is the complexity that Mr Turner was, I'm sorry to say, independently advised that it would be easier and cheaper for him, and I hate to say this, but it would be easier and cheaper for him to wait until Mikey died when a simpler process existed to reclaim the money. He was naturally deeply upset. He was also determined to do something about it, not just for Mikey, but others in the same predicament. I give way. And then for this here, and I did say to him beforehand, and I wanted to give Madam Chair the, the Northern Ireland perspective. In Northern Ireland, the responsibility for the management of the child trust fund accounts for a child whom there is no person with parental responsibility. It's transferred to the Shared Foundation who deal with the inquiries until the child turns 18. What I would suggest would be a good idea, and hopefully the right honourable gentleman would, would also agree. Does the right honourable member agree that responsibility should be given to extended relatives? such as grandparents, etc., to ensure that they are able to provide guidance within a familial uh, setting in relation to finances. A really simple way of doing it. Let the, the grandparents or the extended family look after things. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to my uh, old friend, Member Sam Strangford, for his intervention. Uh, I will touch on the circumstance in Northern Ireland. But the fundamental point here, which I think unites many people in the chamber today, is the desire to get easy access for parents, to ensure uh, that they do not go through a court process incurring fees and going through bureaucracy, uh, requiring support of GPs and social workers, to access what in many cases is an average of about £2,000. It's, it's just too much uh, bureaucracy and work when it's rightfully uh, the uh, asset of their child. Um, I know there are many people in this area, in this chamber today, not just the Honourable Member, who've taken a close interest in this and uh, have far more personal experience than me as the parents of children with disabilities, and they know that parents with, with, with the parents of children with disabilities have so much to do. Often this involves struggling to get what is rightfully theirs from government. This is one area in which Mr Turner felt progress really could be made. The good news is that he found a groundswell of support from parents and charities. I'd like to thank in particular uh, Contact for their support and Renaissance Legal for their tireless campaigning. There is support from child trust fund providers and indeed, I believe, from the Minister. And yet four years on, we are still nowhere near where we need to be. I would like to set out the scale of the problem. I'll set out what I recognise the government has attempted to do to mitigate the issue and lastly, what I believe it should do to go further and to largely resolve it for most families with disabled children. Let's be clear, this is not a new issue. It is very apparent and has been well rehearsed and not only as a result of my constituents' brilliant campaigning. The Public Accounts Committee looked into the issue last year as part of their analysis of child trust funds. It highlighted a wider problem with CTFs as a whole. 
However, the PAC drew particular attention to access for young people lacking the mental capacity to manage their own savings. In these circumstances, a family or carer must gain legal authority to access funds that belong to the young person involved. To do so requires an application for a deputyship order to the Court of Protection in England and Wales. And in England and Wales, the Ministry of Justice estimates that between 63,000 and 126,000 young people may not have the mental capacity to access and manage their matured CTFs when they reach 18. All CTFs will mature between 2020 and 2029. There are therefore tens of thousands of young people who will be subjected to a prohibitively lengthy, costly and complex process to simply access what is rightfully theirs. Dealing with standalone CTF applications, there were just 70 court applications between September 2020 and May 2023, compared to around 27,000 accounts maturing over the same period. The Department, in its Treasury Minute responding to the PAC, broadened the scope of applications to include not just standalone CTF applications, but other assets. However, even on that basis, between September 22 and March 23, the number of applications for 16 to 21 year olds was still only 312. Whichever of the statistics one chooses to quote, thousands are missing out on what is rightfully theirs because we are not informing them of their rights and if we do, the process is too complex and too costly for all but a few. I know the Minister is a decent man. He put aside time to meet Mr Turner and me on this issue and I know has instructed the Department to engage. I know he is keen to make it simpler for families and he has ensured changes have been made. I acknowledge the MOJ last year moved some of the replication online, waiving the fees and creating a toolkit for parents. This is to be welcomed and I believe was introduced with excellent intent. However, the process still involves completing 12 forms, including the duplication of a number of forms, and 93 pages. This includes requiring time-pressured GPs or social workers to complete a 21-page mental capacity assessment, which not all are prepared to do. With all the pressures on the families of disabled young people and the associated cost of becoming a deputy, is it surprising that they do not prioritise accessing what is, on average, funds of around £2,000? But that's £2,000 which could and should be used to the benefit of the disabled child. I know the Minister and his team wish to help further and there is means to do so readily at hand, already in use and absolutely capable of being advertised and delivered on, which could help tens of millions, which could help deliver tens of millions of pounds. Actuarial analysis suggests up to 73 million into the hands of those that desperately need it. I would like to thank the chief executives of the two child trust funds, One Family and Foresters UK, for talking me through their proactive approach, which puts their customers first. These two funds account for over half of all CTFs. Very commendably, these providers recognise the problem and are applying a common sense and pragmatic approach to its resolution. This is, in effect, using the DWP appointee scheme, a tried and tested system to enable families to manage their child benefit income. It provides adequate protection and is the obvious solution to unlock the savings of disabled young people. Let us be clear, this is no free-for-all. The providers require evidence that the parent or guardian is a DWP appointee. They require identity checks and confirmation of the child's capacity. This process is only available to funds under £5,000, and complex cases may still have to go through the courts. But it has enabled the providers to meet the needs of hundreds of disabled children. But there is a problem. Despite it following a DWP process, despite the knowledge that were a DWP appointee to be acting fraudulently, there would be far more at stake than a modest child trust fund, this sensible route is frustratingly not officially sanctioned. The financial institutions are commendably going on risk to allow access to the funds. They know there are far more affected families out there, but as responsible, regulated entities, they do not believe they can advertise their willingness to help in this pragmatic way 
which combines existing safeguards with swift access. These two leading institutions and others with a similar proactive mindset are assisting some 900 families a year, a significant multiple of the court route. But thousands still remain who need support. I therefore have three requests of the Minister, which really would help resolve this issue. Would the Minister engage with DWP to extend the appointee scheme to officially include savings held in CTFs? Uh, would he engage with the finance industry to formalise what is already a successful industry process, and in doing so enable them to advertise that route and enable families to take advantage of a simple scheme? And lastly, will the Minister help families to secure basic information about their CTF provider if the account has been lost? I have just reached my conclusion, but I'll happily give way to my honourable friend. Could I commend my honourable friend for his superb speech and he's approached this debate in an extremely constructive fashion with a common sense, straightforward solution to the problem. Surely we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to apply common sense. Child trust funds are a wonderful advantage to many young people, but the most vulnerable are missing out. And today he has outlined a way in which the government can address the... Um, the biggest part of this problem. Uh, I'm most grateful to my honourable friend, and he brings me brilliantly to my conclusion, uh, which is that I agree with him. <laughs> Movement on those three issues will prevent thousands of unnecessary court applications, reduce bureaucracy and cost for the parents of disabled youngsters, and above all, put, work, put to work funds that could make a real difference to young people who could really do with that little extra help. I beg to move this motion. The question is that this House has considered child trust fund access for people seeking to manage the finances of others. Call Sir Ed Davey. Thank you, uh, Mrs Elliott, uh, and I'd like to pay tribute to the Honourable uh, Member for Horsham for uh, securing this uh, debate, and I agree with everything he said, and I hope there can be cross-party agreement today that we need to move forward at long last. Uh, I'd also like to pay tribute to uh, Andrew Turner, his family, and particularly his son Mikey, for the work they've done. But others, I'm sure Mr Turner would agree, have played a big role. Lawyers like Philip Warford, journalists like uh, Jessica Hewson and Martin Lewis, financial service companies have shown leadership, contact and other charities, the campaigning families, many of whom are here. Um, their voices have come together, and I'm just hoping that the Ministry of Justice is going to listen. Uh, Ms. Ella, I should declare an interest. I have a son whose name is John. He is 16. He has an undiagnosed neurological problem, which means he can't really walk by himself or talk, and he has serious learning disabilities. Um, uh, there's no doubt, I'm afraid, he will never be able to uh, manage his uh, own uh, personal affairs, let alone financial affairs, and although uh, my wife and I and many uh, wonderful professionals work to give him as much independence as possible, uh, there's no way when he comes to the age of 18 uh, that he'll be able to um, get his, the money from his child trust fund. So I declare an interest, um, uh, but I hope I have an insight into the issues that families face, um, the, uh, the problems they have as carers, just, just looking after on a day-to-day -day basis. That can be quite enough without having to worry about uh, lots of bureaucratic forms and having to go to the Court of uh, Protection. Indeed, I've been involved in this debate for some time. I, I met Mr Turner in 2020, and I asked the then Prime Minister a question at PMQs on the 21st of October 2020. Uh, in his reply, the then Prime Minister said he would do whatever I can to help. Whatever I can to help. That was a promise nearly four years ago, and we are still here so hopefully we can do a bit better today. Uh, in result, after that, I met the, uh, the minister who was then doing the current minister's job, who's now the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Justice. I think I met him three times, and we discussed all the different options. We've seen all the work that's uh, been put forward, the waivers, the so-called simplification of the forms, the digitalization, all the attempts to try to uh, make this work. Sometimes, when, particularly when the Ministry of Justice put forward the consultation on the small payment scheme, I supported it. I didn't think it was the best solution, but I was trying to be constructive. Let's go along with this, let's try and make uh, this work. But I'm afraid all these efforts have failed, demonstrably, by the statistics that the Honourable Gentleman Member for Horsham showed and uh, many others. Uh, so I'm afraid, to date, the Ministry of Justice has utterly failed to solve this problem.
And so I just think we need to get action here. We can't wait much longer. The number of uh, young people and their families, the amount of money just, just builds up time. It's not going to go away unless it's one minister, I'm sure it's the minister for us today, will actually grasp this properly. Um, I personally initially set out believing that the DWP appointee scheme was the right one. Uh, it's one that families are aware of. It's worked in government. It's worked actually for funds much larger because the amount of money you get through DLA or PIP uh, uh, for your loved one far outweighs the amount of money that the, the average child trust fund has, but apparently that's not possible because there was some difference between flows of money from DWP and savings and capital. I, I, for life of me, I never quite understood that distinction, but maybe there's something uh, in it, and I will come to what I think is behind the Ministry of Justice um, objections in a second. But in, all, in the spirit of wanting to be uh, constructive, there are two solutions, it seems to me, that on the table. The one that the Honourable Gentleman talked about, which is this proposal for a new one-off order solution. So um, a family would still have to fill in a form, but it would be a one-pager. It would still have to go to the Court of Protection, but it would be a very, very simple process. Uh, and I think it's been well thought through by campaigners. Uh, different fund managers have been involved. And I believe Mr. Turner has written to the Ministry of Justice before Christmas. Unfortunately, he received an email from an official in December 2023, which stated, we are not able to consider any proposals for an alternative process for accessing child trust funds at this time, end quote. That's not good enough, Minister. Um, people are working hard to come forward with practical solutions within the remit of the Ministry of Justice, and officials aren't even willing to see people who are trying to be constructive. This one-off one -off order solution, I think, would work. I'd like to ask him, and he may not be able to answer me today, to get, off, get this one-off order solution working. Will it require primary legislation change, secondary legislation change, or would the Registrar of the Court of Protection simply have to change the Ministry for Rules? It's probably as simple as that, uh, and it would suddenly unlock uh, this problem, both for child trust funds and junior ICES. Um, so that's one solution which the MOJ would be in control of. There's another solution which the Honourable Gentleman touched on, which is working through the financial service companies who've shown huge flexibility in this and taken risk upon themselves. Uh, uh, that's not an MOJ responsibility. I think MOJ would have to go and talk to the Treasury, because I think government has landed this in the, in the lap of the MOJ and said, you sort it out. But if the, if, uh, if the minister was to go to the Chancellor or the Treasury ministers and say, look, um, we want you to say this, and we're happy for you to say this, all a Treasury minister would probably have to say would be, we are relaxed about um, fund managers of child trust funds or junior ICES taking this approach, taking the risk on themselves if anyone objects, but for them to both market, give information, and promote the idea uh, that um, the uh, people with DDP uh, point of status can, can uh, uh, use these funds and transact them on behalf of their loved one. That would be a, what you might call a market solution, but it would, I think the way government works, in my own insight into government, it requires the MOJ mm -hmm. to give the green light to the Treasury to make that statement. Two really simple, zero-cost solutions to allow vulnerable people to get their own money, to get their own money. And I really are, I urge the Minister, after four years of trying, let's, let's just wake up and smell the coffee. Why might the MOJ be objecting to this? Let's, let's put myself in his shoes, in the shoes of the officials, to work out what on earth is going on here. Well, the first thing may be the Mental Capacity Act 2005, the Court of Protection, and principles underlying those. When a, prince, when a uh, official in the department has jurisdiction over an act of parliament, they can get very jealous about how it's worked and not want to see any change. And I get that. We've been there. But... Protecting that principle behind the Act has to be challenged by democratic elected politicians to see and test it whether that principle is being taken too far. Because in law, there are other principles that apply. One is called proportionality. Proportionality, Minister. Reasonableness. And surely those principles apply here. We're talking about small amounts of money for very vulnerable people whose parents and carers ain't got the time 
to go to court. They may phone one person and say, look, can you help me? And then the other person at the financial service company or the court says, well, you know, it's a bit complicated. They just give up because their, ch their young person is in pain and needs medical help and needs to go to the hospital. That's the reality of the life. The specific point of proportionality. Uh, would you not agree that, firstly, the financial providers are talking about sums below £5,000, and the average child trust fund here is about 2000 And the second thing is the DWP appointee scheme. Um, the DWP appointee scheme, uh, Madam Chairman, is uh, it, it, the, the amount of money going through that would be tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, in, in seen in relation to the child trust fund issue, uh, the child trust fund issue is a tiny amount of money. Uh, so on the grounds of proportionality, I think my, the right honourable gentleman is making an extremely good case. Strongly agree with him. He might be interested to know that principle five. I'm told I'm not an expert, uh, uh, Mrs. Elliot, but principle five of the Mental Capacity Act talks about least restrictive means, least restrictive means to achieve the best interests of the vulnerable adult. Now, you know, <laughs> could the MCA apply itself to itself, please? Now, there's another reason, Mrs. Elliot, why I wonder whether the Ministry of Justice uh, is sticking to the principle despite all the evidence, despite all the pressure. And maybe they want to get more people uh, to go to the court protection so the judges there can uh, help with the deputyships of these vulnerable adults as they go into their, uh, they, they turn 18 and go beyond that. And, you know, one can have a discussion about whether or not more families should ultimately go to the court of protection. But when you read the guidelines of the court of protection, how it should operate, it really sees itself, and I think rightly, uh, to be a court almost of last resort where there is a family dispute about money or m more likely about how a person should be cared for, who should, be, who should care for them, where should they live. And sometimes if there's a dispute in the family, you do need the court, and the court of protection is brilliant at that. Sometimes uh, a vulnerable adult may have no loved one or family member, and then the court of protection obviously plays, uh, fills that vacuum quite rightly. But if families can come to an agreement amongst themselves, then more often than that, it's going to be rather better than having to go to the court of protection. Now, make the court of protection available to more, ad ad advertise it, market it, and people uh, you know, may want to think about that in due course. I and my wife, we're old parents. My son's 16, I'm 58, so I'm quite an old dad. And I worry about when, he di when I die, and my wife and I die, he's still going to be, he uh, doesn't have a degenerative condition, um, and he's going to live for quite a few years. So, you know, of course I'm thinking, we're thinking in due course of going to the court of protection or, or some other means or getting a, a family member, his sister, or one of his cousins to be there for him. So the court of protection say it has good, good reasons to be there. No one's against it but use it when it's needed. I mean, maybe the Ministry of Justice thinks it's got so many, no court backlogs, there's lot, loads of judges, they're just sitting there twiddling their thumbs, give them more business. Come on, take, take, take these pressures off the system, please, by adopting something that, that's simple. I mean, I'm only, the, I have to say, and I don't like saying this, Mrs. Elliot, there may be a reason why people uh, in the judiciary and legal profession are keen to force people to go to court of protection, even when it's disproportionate. Maybe it's vested interests. I hope that's not what we're dealing with. I really hope that is not what we're dealing with, because it's not acceptable. We're talking about people who are vulnerable, parents and carers who are stretched to their limits. And we're talking about small amounts of money. So can I just urge the minister to listen to us, to go back to his department, go to his Secretary of State and say, the officials need to be overruled on this. Some of the judiciary who, uh, from the Court of Protection need to be overruled on this. We need to act proportionally. We need to act in the best interest of thousands of young people who should ha be, have access to their own money. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, very pleased to be able to speak in support of the debate uh, brought by my right honourable friend. And it's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure to follow the right honourable gentleman who spoke so well. And, of course, Madam Chair, I entirely agree with what's been said. I had the pleasure of speaking a few weeks ago at a conference organised by the Share Foundation. Gavin Oldham is here with us today. Uh, and Andrew Turner uh, spoke at this uh, as well and laid out all the practical 
challenges that we've heard discussed. There was also a speech, a very good speech, made by Ruth Kelly, the former Labour minister who had oversight of the Child Trust Fund policy when it was introduced. And it inspired me to recognise how often good conservative policies are introduced by non-conservative uh, uh, governments, because um, I, I have great respect for this, uh, for, the, for, the, for the policy. Um, she also, we also discussed, I think somebody, another speaker discussed the real genesis of the Child Trust Fund, which was, of course, Tom Paine in the 17, uh, 70s and 80s, who wrote about a, 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 an approach of, by which government simply gave families uh, a lump of capital as a means of sustaining them and ensuring that they developed uh, the, the habits of thrift and industry and self-reliance that we all need. And actually, Madam Chair, we might remember in the 1990s, the then Labour opposition were developing ideas around what they called asset-based welfare, which I think is a very good principle and one, and I, don't, I wouldn't give it to Labour entirely. Uh, we all share these ideas. Order. Order. The sitting is suspended for 45 minutes for four divisions in the House. Please can all uh, members, honourable members, please return swiftly or by 5.41 at the latest where we will continue the debate. Thank you.
yes, that you'll have to tell them. <laughs> So we're choking. Everybody come. Order, order. The sitting is resumed. Uh, the debate may now continue until 6.15. I call Danny Kruger to resume his speech. Thank you very much. I shall resume rather than starting again, uh, <laughs> uh, Madam Chair. Um, I was saying that the origins of the, of this, uh, the Child Trust Fund, I think, have their roots in a very uh, good British tradition of the principle of asset-based welfare. And in uh, the... 1990s, there was a tussle about a, an approach to public services. On the one hand, what we've come to call new public management, quite centralised, quite bureaucratic, you know, quasi-market systems based on individual entitlements, uh, comprehensive services, versus this approach of asset-based welfare, which was really about putting capital into families and supporting communities to develop their own collective responses to social challenges. Um, and under the new Labour years, the, the new public management model won out, with this, with this great and noble exception of the Child Trust Fund, which is such a brilliant innovation, and I think such an important principle for the idea that people should be entrusted to manage wealth and to sustain their families directly. And um, I regret, personally, that in the 2010, when the coalition government came in, the Child Trust Fund was abandoned. I was going to make, have a pop at the Liberal Democrats, who uh, I'm sure were responsible for the uh, scrapping of the, uh, the Child Trust Fund. Um, but, uh, but let's ju just blame George Osborne, because uh, we, we can all unite on that. And, uh, and, uh, but, of course, the Junior ISIS was, was established instead, which is a very good principle. Um, and, uh, Madam Chair, I want to echo the points that have been made very eloquently by, the, by right honourable members about the real injustice that families endure now with the, uh, the fact that back in those days when the Child Trust Fund was created, not enough consideration was given to children uh, without, the, without mental capacity to access and manage their own finances when they uh, became adults. And I think something very wrong was done in the, it, without anybody intending it, uh, without this being properly thought through. And I won't repeat the points made by my right honourable friend, but I think we have a huge... Uh, obligation now to to right this injustice. It's also worth pointing out, not, not just that we have many tens of thousands of young people locked out of money which is rightfully theirs, and as we've heard, you know, without the capacity, without the, 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 the money to, or the, the incentive, frankly, to pursue a uh, court of protection case to unlock it. We also have a significant negative incentive, disincentive, to open a, a junior ISA for uh, if, if, if uh, parents have a disabled child, thinking about the long-term future of whether it would be possible to access that money. So we're inhibiting the principle of saving altogether. I think very good suggestions have been made by the Right Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton and my Right Honourable Friend from Horsham about a one-off order solution. Absolutely echo the case made there. And also for this DWP appointee scheme. The fact that we do that for benefits, which, as we've heard, often account for much greater sums of money than the Child Trust Fund means that we should extend that too. And I agree with the uh, right honourable gentleman about relieving the pressure on the court of protection. So I'll just finish, Madam Chair, with the observation that the principle of Child Trust Funds, such a good one, such an important principle in what should be the welfare model we have. And it's not the, the injustice we have at the moment of the complexity of the system, the fact that there are so many dormant accounts, doesn't just apply for the families who know about it and want to 
have access to the money that belongs to their disabled children. There are many millions of young people who don't know that they have the right to this money, that this money is in fact rightfully theirs. And I understand there are around six million young people who, in theory, in fact in, in reality, have an account worth around two million, uh, two thousand pounds each that they're unaware of. And it's estimated that around a million of those young people will come from deprived circumstances. So what an enormous injustice it is that all that money is sitting there in government accounts uh, that, is not, that they're not able to access. And it's been described as, a, uh, as an experience of malign neglect. So it won't be deliberate. Nobody is actively trying to uh, prevent young people accessing the money that is rightfully theirs. But nevertheless, and as for reasons we've heard with respect to disabled children, young people, but also with respect to young people more widely, they're not being given access to the money that is rightfully theirs. And I echo the point made uh, by campaigners, um, including Gavin uh, Oldham from the Share Foundation, for a, a system of a, of, a, of a default withdrawal policy, whereby young people who are registered with HMRC, uh, the system knows their bank details. Uh, around 60%, I understand, of young people with, uh, with, with child trust fund accounts that they've not yet accessed could simply be given the money. That should, simply, that should happen. There would need to be communications and, and, and information campaign around that. But I think that is the right thing to do, and not least because it would stop this outrage of these companies charging 25% fee for the benefit of informing young people of the fact that they have this money. So this is, I think, the future model, uh, Madam Chair. I think as a country we should be proud of the principle of child trust funds. I think there's a lot of people now th thinking increasingly that we do need to develop approaches around asset-based welfare. I noticed David Willits, former colleague of ours, is proposing something similar, a capital sum granted to young people at coming of age. And I know that Gavin Oldham has suggested that inheritance tax receipts should be used to invest in child trust funds for the future. So I think this is an old idea whose time has come. And I hope we can fix these immediate problems we've got and then think more broadly about how to extend this model more widely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's a special pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon. And I, I pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Horsham for securing this debate on the behalf of his constituent, Andrew Turner, and congratulate him on a fulsome speech which actually outlined very clearly the challenge that is actually before us today. I'd also uh, like to uh, comment on the, the speech from the, the Right Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton, and I'm grateful to him for sharing his personal experience with his son John, you know, and, you know, along with, and along with his uh, experience of the system, I think he demonstrated a special empathy with other parents of children with very challenging disabilities. And, you know, he offered solutions, and uh, I remind the House of his most important, important statement that people are just after their own money. He also spoke of the need for a simpler system, and that was, um, that was repeated by the, uh, the Honourable Member for Devices. I've just found out how to uh, pronounce that properly. I hope I did it justice this time. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he lamented the fact that uh, we no longer have uh, the Children's uh, Trust Fund as set up by the Labour government. And, uh, but he did try to blame the Right Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton but it was the Right Honourable Member's colleague in the Treasury that did so. The same person, I'll uh, advise the House, that axed the hospital that was planned to be built in my constituency of Stockton, where uh, health inequalities uh, have in fact uh, widened ever since, and it's not even on the government's new list. And uh, the Honourable Member for uh, uh, Devices also I confirmed that we do have a consensus in the room that uh, we need that, uh, we need action, and uh, he said simply give them the money, which I think was a good way of, uh, for me to start, or at least uh, at the mention at the beginning of my speech. Now, Andrew's fervent campaign to bring about change in this area stems from the challenges in his own family. They've come up against tremendous uh, problems along the way simply to get access for the money saved for their son, Mikey. Members have heard of the distress faced by Mikey's family and others. And to hear that deeply disturbing legal advice that Andrew received, that it would be easier and cheaper to wait until Mikey died because then a simpler process could be used. 
I can't find any words to describe the anguish in such circumstances. Now, Andrew has become an advocate for the many parents of children with disabilities who all too often come up, come up against these barriers, and I pay tribute to him and charities like Contact for their hard work on this issue. I would also like to thank the other parent campaigners, Nazim Yazin, Claire Binney, Michelle Creed, Ramadeep Kaur, Rachel Dixon and John Roberts and their son Joseph for joining us here today. Now the fund introduced in 2005 saw every child born in the UK between September 2002 and January 2011 receive up to £500 in government vouchers as an incentive for their parents and guardians to open a savings account for them, an initiative ditched by the coalition government in 2011 when the junior ISA was created. Now, disabled children and those from low-income families received additional amounts to provide greater benefits in later life. Trust money was then locked away, with parents able to act more to the account each year until the child turned 18. But again, as we've heard, parents of children who lack the mental capacity to manage their finances themselves once they turn 18 are faced with making a deputyship application to the Court of Protection to access their Child Trust Fund or Junior ISA. The Ministry of Justice estimates that between 63,000 and 126,000 young people may fall into this category, yet the Court of Protection approved only 15 applications in 2021. Now, the Minister will be aware that Andrew wrote to the Lord Chancellor yesterday outlining the scale of the challenge. He highlights that since 2020, an estimated 31,488 disabled young people have been unable to access £72.4 million of their trust fund, child trust fund and junior ISA savings. Now, the Public Accounts Committee looked into this particular matter and they highlighted reports that families find the deputyship application process difficult, time-consuming and costly. Fees are waived if families are applying to access a child trust fund, but there are other barriers. The committee had examples of a six-page GP letter being needed as part of the process. The Down Syndrome Association said in evidence that low awareness about banking safeguards among parents it supports is also a barrier to accessing their children's child trust funds. It explained the fee waiver does not apply if the young adult is still in education and that many families believe they also need to pay for the services of a solicitor. Now, I recognise the government has considered measures it hoped would address the problem over the years and uh, the, the, the problems that we come to discuss today. But the legislation and processes put in place to support individuals and their families should be much, much more accessible. What we need is closer working between the finance industry and government departments to find a workable solution to this ongoing problem as it has the potential to significantly increase accessibility, helping many more families access savings locked in child trust funds and junior ISAs. Now, I agree with the statement from Una Somerson, Head of Policy and Public Affairs at Contact. She said... Implementing a less restrictive approach is, the best, is in the best interest of disabled young people. Disabled young people must be allowed to enjoy their savings like everybody else. Continuing to promote actions that fail to address this issue will simply per perpetuate injustice. There is an opportunity to bring common sense into the debate and to commit to a new approach. I will. And giving way. He's made a very powerful speech and thank you for thank him for his kind uh, comments. Um, we're all hoping that the Minister will take the opportunity to make some changes today and to tell us all that they are going to look at this again and make changes. But will he uh, agree with me that um, the next election and the next Parliament, if this government fails to make changes, it's vital that his party, working with others, makes these changes? Yes, I am grateful to the Honourable Member for his intervention. And yes, whichever government is in power have to make the changes necessary in order to make this much easier for people to access the funds. I don't know what the mechanism will be, but I think we can all say that the next government, perhaps of either, either colour, will in fact deliver on that particular promise. But the Minister, I'm sure, might get this sorted out before, uh, before we have that general election, because I think today was the, may have been the last day that uh, the Prime Minister could have called the election, but we've still got, uh, we've still got a few hours to go, but uh, bring that on. 
Now, the government, in its consultation response, referred to clear evidence of the challenges in the current system, with the Court of Protection Property and Affairs application forms being too lengthy and complex, and the time taken between completing the application to the final order being made is too long and disproportionate for the sums involved. Instead of a wholesale change, however, the government opted for incremental changes to the current court process. In 2023, the Ministry of Justice created a toolkit for parent carers on making financial decisions and implementing a new digital process for property and affairs deputy order applications rolled out last year. Set to speed up the process, users can complete some of their court forms electronically and digitally submit remaining paperwork. Sadly, contact tell me that uh, none of the government's piecemeal changes have meaningfully simplified the court process or made it more accessible for families with no legal experience. The government's strategy, sadly, is not working if their intended aim was really to have a process as accessible and possible. It simply hasn't been achieved. But I hope the Minister will outline the impacts of these changes have had on application processing times, address whether further digitisation of the Court of Protection processes is planned, and outline exactly how the government is going to remove these blockages to the funds once and for all. Let them have their own money. Um, first of all, I have to thank my rational friend, the member for Horsham, uh, for securing this debate and uh, continuing with the conversation that we've had uh, for some time. Um, I was pleased to meet with him and his constituent, Mr Turner, uh, last May to discuss this issue, and I do welcome the ongoing debate we're having. Uh, Ms Ellis, I won't tiptoe down memory lane like uh, 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 colleagues have. I'm not sure what value revisiting the coalition governments of 2010 onwards is particularly helpful to today's debate. What I do want to do, I think it's important, and I'm sorry if it's going to be dry, is it is important to actually lay out the legal framework that is there to protect vulnerable people. And I understand very clearly the, uh, the actions of the vast majority of parents are well-intentioned and act with great honour and kindness looking after their child or their young adult. However, my job, of course, is also to protect vulnerable people from any form of abuse. And that weighs very heavily on any reforms that we take forward. And I appreciate people will disagree vehemently with me, but I do have to take into account that not every parent would act with the best of intentions when acting, act, accessing these funds. We do know... Ms. Elliott, that is a well-established common law principle that an adult must obtain proper legal authority to access or manage the finances or property of another adult. That includes, for the purpose of today's debate, a matured child trust fund of a young adult. And people are, understandably, unaware of this legal principle, and it may be surprising to parents and carers who have been very heavily involved in the decision-making for their young person prior to them turning 18. And I do want to uh, iterate what steps we've already taken to try and improve the process and also particularly to try and improve the awareness of what steps need to be taken as uh, the young person uh, goes over the age of 18. Mr. Of course. Mr. I'm grateful for Mr. Dean Wade. Before he talks about the reforms and, uh, that have been made, can I bring him back to the point of principle he just outlined at the beginning of his remarks? Um, I don't think anyone disagrees that there's an important principle there. But there's equally a principle of proportionality, which I made in my speech. Could he address that point? Uh, where does proportionality uh, arise in his thinking about the principles involved? Well, I'll have to say to the right of event, I'm very happy to have a, an ongoing conversation. In fact, this is the first time we've actually discussed this face-to-face. -face. We've not discussed this before since I took on this portfolio. But proportionality is a very valid point, but what is the level of risk the, the right honourable gentleman is willing to take will be very different from the level of risk I'm prepared to take or the government is prepared to take. The right honourable gentleman, anybody in this room, may be prepared to say 10, 20, 100, 1,000 young people could have their money accessed inappropriately. That's the proportionate risk they're willing to take. My view is I want to minimise that risk, and their proportionality is not a, an easily measured... 
Uh, I'm not a lawyer, maybe a legal. And I looked to my right honourable friend, who I think is a lawyer. I looked to my legal friend and said, maybe there is a definition of proportionality. But the definition of proportionality on those who are making decisions against those who are actually asking for change may be very different. But I'm willing to see if we can bridge the gap. But my view is I want to ensure that we can improve access, but also ensure that protections remain in place so that those who may not have the best interests of the young adults uh, in mind uh, do not get access to the funds uh, with total liberty. Uh, answer. Um, it was direct to the point, uh, and he's given way again, which is very uh, ge generous. Um, when we're looking at this risk, though, we, we actually have evidence from the, the industry. The industry has looked at this case, and many of the firms and funders have said, we're prepared to take the risk on ourselves, even though the government isn't behind it. These, these firms, because the risk and the amount of money is so small, they've taken that risk on themselves. Uh, isn't that not a lesson uh, that the, the ministers should to dwell on. And if the MOJ isn't prepared to act on that, would he at least uh, go and talk to his colleagues at the Treasury and see if they can make a statement about uh, the, the way that the financial service could take on that risk and how the government would support that? Certainly, I'm always uh, happy to discuss uh, with any provider, and certainly the provider I've spoken to, uh, and no provider has beaten their path to my door saying that we think you've got it wrong and our risk assessment is right. Of course, any organisation is entitled to, take, to make their own risk assessment and take the consequences if they get it wrong. Uh, and that's there for their decision. My risk assessment is perhaps I'm being overcautious. I'm willing to be challenged on that and I appreciate people have a different view. But I want to ensure that I take the least risk to vulnerable adults. But certainly my conversations, and I, I will talk briefly uh, in the time left, about the work we've done uh, with TISA to try and improve accessibility and knowledge. So if I may, uh, Ms Ellis, I'll have to skip over now, given the time, about the, the legal framework of the Mental Capacity Act. I think everyone in the room is probably aware of the, the methodology of applying for the deputyship that gives people access or the ability to act on other people's behalf. So I won't go through that in any great depth. But we have heard uh, that the court process was cumbersome, and that's why we did look to see how we can um, change that. We did consult as to what kind of different uh, system we could put in place, but there actually was not a consistent view from the consultation on how we should reform uh, the access to these funds. Because, in fact, when you go into the consultation, many people wanted to add safeguards into a new form of access that actually made the system even more cumbersome than the one we were trying to reform. So that was a difficulty. We didn't get, actually, a common view on what checks and balances needed to be in place. But we also did, just not talk to uh, you know, parents, we talked to charitable organisations, legal and finance sectors, groups representing the elderly, etc., etc. Uh, and what we did here is it was too complex, but the big message that came out was that people weren't really aware of what they had to do or when they had to do it. And so one of the things uh, I think that uh, my rightful friend asked, I think it was his first ask, was uh, would we extend appointeeships to cover child trust funds? Um, we are working with the Department of Work and Pensions to extend um, the availability of information. Uh, and so to, without taking that at all, I'm more than willing to go back to the DWP and talk about whether their process uh, is uh, suitable uh, for child trust funds. It's a very different process in terms of it is accessing regular payments rather than lump sums. So there is a different quantum at risk, uh, but equally it will take primary legislation. So it is not, we double check this today, it would take primary legislation uh, to, uh, if you like, copy or access the DWP type processes. So it's not a quick fix, uh, but it's certainly one that I'm more than happy to go back and have another look at. But in terms of uh, what we've actually done, is um, I wanted to ensure that we've been trying to streamline the process. Can we take the paper out? Can we use more digital processes? And what we've seen is that the time has been reduced from 24 weeks to 12 weeks currently, and we'll continue to liaise with the presence of the Court of Protection to monitor performance to see what more can be done. Now, one of the key issues 
is that people often don't know what they have to do until the child turns 18, and then they are locked out. So what we are looking to do, and we've done first two things, um, and apologise if this sounds a little disjointed, but I sat down with TISA, the major um, provider of these child trust funds, and we have agreed that they will write out, as, pa as part of their normal uh, maturity uh, mailing, they will include in that mailing uh, advice and information about how to actually access and use the court of protection to get the relevant legal powers in place. So that we are taking early steps to educate people as to what they need to do before uh, the person turns 18. That alongside, as uh, our members have commented, uh, the, the toolkit, which provides practical guidance in terms of how to access the legal process and how to navigate through it. Um, I, I've mentioned also, uh, I say, the mailing uh, that we've uh, agreed uh, with uh, TISA, uh, but also one of the uh, second asks was making people aware of how to find these lost funds. And so we, we are doing more work to provide information, and people can use the Find My Child Trust Fund service on gov.uk, and we can continue to do more to raise awareness of that so that people are... Of course? It's good for those that are giving way. I'm just listening up. It's a good idea that uh, the providers are prepared to write out uh, and provide that additional information, and I personally welcome that. It's not going to solve the, solve the problem, but what I would say to the Minister is, does he agree with me that it's no good that just being a one-off? This is going to have to be something that's done on a regular basis because as uh, young people become more and more mature and move towards the age of 18. Uh, the, uh, my, uh, the Honourable Friend, the, the Shadow Minister, preempts. Uh, the, this is a regular communication strategy. TISA will continue to uh, notify those who are heading towards maturity what they need to do um, to actually access should they, uh, once they turn 18. Alongside that, alongside that, I've been working with the Department for Working Pensions on accessing their, um, if like, their client bank, and so we have agreed that they to be able to contact with DDP the cohort of parents and carers. Um, who receive um, uh, PIP payments who may lack mental capacity to access their child trust fund. And we have an agreement in principle that we were doing a mailing, and this will not just be a one-off, this will be a constant mailing, so that as people um, in this cohort, which we think is particularly relevant uh, to the child trust fund and uh, difficulties of access, became aware in advance of what they need to do. Because one of the big messages from the consultation was our lack of understanding and our lack of knowledge of the steps until it was too late. So I appreciate um, that members have said, you know, give them the money. But equally, and I get that, and uh, as I mentioned at the very start, uh, for the vast majority of parents, uh, they act in the very best interest. And I cannot, I'm not a parent, so I cannot possibly understand um, the, the role of a parent having to juggle all of the demands of everyday life and having a child that needs uh, additional support. And I accept that. My knowledge is very limited. But I, it does weigh very heavily on me that I want to ensure that just one parent not acting in the best interest and accessing those funds inappropriately weighs very heavily on me. So I accept all the points of proportionality and I'm very happy to have a conversation as to where that line is drawn on risk. Uh, but broadly speaking, where I'm coming from is improving education, improving access, improving knowledge. But I'm not going to, and I cannot in all conscience say, I'm going to throw open the accounts and give unfettered access without some checks and safeguards to ensure that a very small minority do not have the ability to abuse a young uh, adult, but I will commit uh, to following through with colleagues at WP on the scheme they use to see if there's anything we can do to copy it or piggyback it to make the system more accessible. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Mr. Jeremy Quinn, Thank you, uh, 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 Ms. Elliott. It's a, um, look, I'm grateful for the Minister's candour uh, with us uh, today. We, we've heard what he's had to say. I like the right one, the member for uh, Kingston upon Thames. I was keen to work with the Minister and I know he has put in, in uh, train changes uh, to seek to improve the situation. It's pleased to, I'm pleased to hear what he said about the mailing and certainly we will, I'm sure, work with him to see how uh, it can be improved. 
but despite his absolutely genuine intent, which I know is genuine, and that is genuine worries about making certain there is a scheme that is safe for all, there is still a concern here, and this is about proportionality, that thousands of young people may miss out because of the Minister's genuine concern about what could be a very, very small number indeed. I come back to the point on DWP appointee scheme. If fraud is at work, and that's always a risk in any form of the government distributing money or giving access to money, if fraud is at work, there is far, far bigger fish to fry here than the Child Trust Fund, and trying to avoid that tiny risk uh, does prevent access for many thousands of people. And I think we should be able to find a more effective and secure, yet secure way through it. So I would urge him to keep reviewing it. I'm very pleased to hear what he says about talking to DWP about uh, that process. Uh, I understand the point he makes on primary legislation. But ultimately, if it requires primary legislation to ensure that we can right a wrong and get fairness, it would not, I'm sure, be a controversial bit of legislation. And what on earth are we here for? Uh, so I look forward to ongoing discussions with the Minister and finding a solution that absolutely works for all these disabled young people and their families. The question is that this House has considered child trust fund access for people seeking to manage the finances of others. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting stands adjourned. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.